when I checked the church calendar this morning, or when I checked the church calendar, this morning was the fourth Sunday of proper time. I'm not sure how that works out. Or it was called proper four, and I'm not sure uh, why it's proper four, except to say that this is what's called ordinary time on the church calendar. <coughs> what is ordinary time? It's the time between the holidays. <coughs> so we're just coming off of um, uh, Passover. We're just coming off of um, Pentecost. I, I'm trying to use the Hebrew names for these things. We're just coming off of Pesach and Shavuot. Um, we're just coming off of Passover and uh, Pentecost. Um, and um, you know, before that it was, was Lent. And before that it was the, 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 the Christmas season. There's nothing going on in the church calendar right now. And it's really kind of nice. Um, so I thought that what I would do... Um, is to uh, start a somewhat longish sermon series. Uh, six weeks, maybe eight weeks, going through the book of Galatians. Um, so, if you will, open your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1. And we will start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. Oh, yeah, yeah, go for it, go for it. Galatians 1 1. Yep. <laughs> well, um, I mean, you're welcome to follow along. You don't, you certainly don't have to, but. I like to listen. Me too. I listen to a lot of sermons on YouTube when I'm at home. I really, I really enjoy that. You just never know. Right. Andrew. Only thing we have to watch the car. Fire alarm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Galatians one one. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches in Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of God, our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but that there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Let's bow our hearts for just a moment. Father, in these next few moments, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> Do you ever turn on the news or turn on a late night television program like, uh, you know, Johnny Carson or... or, or, or Jay Leno, and you can just tell that they're angry. You can tell by the way they start talking they're angry. Now, 
Normally, Johnny Carson comes out with a big smile on his face. He sticks his hands in his pockets. He, 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 he sort of wiggles around with that big goofy grin and he puts everybody at ease. And Jay Leno did the same thing because he learned that from Johnny Carson. But lately, we've had um, late night comedians like Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, Jimmy has taken it upon himself to be the, the, the champion of the downtrodden and the, the voice of the defenseless. And so occasionally Jimmy will come out and he'll, he'll give his big goofy grin and he'll start telling some jokes and it'll be pretty funny. But sometimes Jimmy comes out and he's not telling jokes. Sometimes Jimmy Kimmel comes out on the stage and he is angry. He has something that he wants to say. He's got a bee in his bonnet and he's going to get right to it. Did you hear the way Paul begins the letter to the Galatians? He doesn't say, greetings. He doesn't say, I wish you well. I am so happy that you are abounding in the love of Christ he signs the letter first, which is the common practice in the day. He says who he is and gives his credentials. And what are the credentials that Paul gives at the beginning of Galatians? An apostle not from men. You didn't make me an apostle. I'm not responsible to you. You don't have any authority over me. You don't have any sway over me. And by the way, men should not have any sway over you. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man. I didn't even become an apostle because a man made me an apostle. I became an apostle because through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me to the churches at Galatia. Now, he's already brought the crucifixion and the resurrection into it. He's already taught the gospel. In the very first breath of his letter, in the very first half a sentence, Paul has already reminded them of the gospel. And then there's the customary greeting at the beginning of a Hellenic letter. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. Did you forget? Did you forget that Jesus gave himself for our sins? Have you already forgotten it? Because I've just now reminded you twice. That Jesus gave himself for our sins. To deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God the Father. According to the will of our God and Father. To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished. Right? Jimmy Kimmel is not telling jokes. Paul is not sugarcoating what he's about to say. Paul is angry. And why is Paul angry? I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. And then he interjects and he says, not that there is another one, there is no other gospel, but there are some who trouble you to distort the gospel of Christ. That is, some people among you have decided to tell you things that are not true. They are already distorting the gospel of Christ. Luke isn't even dead yet. Mark, Peter, they're all still around and they're already, someone is already distorting. Now, who is the someone? We'll get to that in a few weeks. Someone is already distorting the gospel. How would you know? If someone is distorting the gospel, how would you know it? Now let's try this one. The gospel is our Heavenly Father's plan of happiness. The central doctrine of the gospel is atonement of Jesus Christ. Our prophet said, the first principles of ordinance are... Of, of the gospel are, first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second, repentance, third, baptism by immersion for the for remission of sins, fourth, laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
in its fullness, the gospel includes all the doctrines, principles, laws, ordinances, and covenants necessary for us to be exalted in the celestial kingdom. The Savior has promised that if we endure to the end, faithfully living the gospel, He will hold us guiltless before the Father at the final judgment. How many, how many like this? By show of hands, how many think this is good? The fullness of the gospel has been preached in all the ages when God's children have been prepared to receive it in the latter days the, or, or, or the dispensation of the fullness of times. The gospel has been restored to us through the prophet Joseph Smith. What was I just reading? I was reading straight off of the LDS website. This is the definition of the gospel according to the Mormons. Now, did you see it? And I don't mean the name in the last line, but did you see the variances before we got to the name? Did you see the differences in the gospel? Do you see why Paul is angry? We as Christians do not believe the gospel is our Heavenly Father's plan of happiness. Have, have, have we ever taught that the gospel is our Heavenly Father's plan of happiness? Have we ever used words that sound like that? No. And neither does Paul. Paul was certainly not happy when he was shipwrecked or beaten or imprisoned or stoned or shipwrecked again or stoned again or beaten again or imprisoned again or stoned again. We do not believe the gospel is God's plan of happiness. We believe the gospel is God's plan of holiness. We are filled with joy at the gospel, but that's something different. You can be sad and be joyous at the same time. You cannot be sad and happy at the same time. What is joy? Joy is a continual overflowing of the knowledge that you are secure for all eternity in Christ Jesus. And how do we come by that joy? Through the gospel. Okay, so... We keep reading in this LDS statement of the gospel and we find our prophet said, and here I cheated just a little bit and I edited out the prophet's name so that I could hold it to the end. But our prophet Joseph Smith said, the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are, first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, repentance. Third, baptism by immersion for the forgiveness, for the remission of sins. Now what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? We remember, we remember back in Genesis 3. We remember back in Genesis 2 when God says, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree, for on the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then, in the next chapter, the serpent comes to Eve and he says, Hath God said, you shall not eat of the tree? And Eve says, we shall not eat of it, nor shall we touch it, lest we die. What? God didn't say you can't touch the tree. Now, it's probably a good idea not to touch the tree. But God didn't say you can't touch the tree. What happened there? Someone... Someone being Adam, probably well-meaning enough, passed the message on to Eve and he added his own little twist on it. So what do we find here in this Mormon declaration of the gospel? We find um, the principles and ordinances of the gospel are, first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, repentance. Third, baptism by immersion. By immersion? Where do we find that in the scriptures? We don't. Just like Adam said, Adam added to God's commandment and said, You shall not touch it. Smith adds to the doctrine of baptism by saying, Immersion. It's not in the scriptures. Now, how do we baptize? There are three different ways to baptize. Which one is correct? I don't know. 
But I don't think it matters. I don't think that water baptism has any real effect. I think water baptism is an outward sign of an inward change. So, Paul tells us uh, that the Hebrews were baptized in the Red Sea when they crossed through it and they didn't even get wet. Now, the first, uh, this was the first big one. As I was reading through it the first time, it says, in, um, in the fullness, uh, in its fullness, the gospel includes all the doctrines, principles, laws, ordinances, and covenants necessary for us to be exalted in the celestial kingdom. Has anyone ever heard of that? And all the time you spent in church, and all the time you spent reading the Bible, have you ever heard that we are to be exalted in the celestial kingdom? No. What does that mean? Well, we don't find it in the scriptures. We are raised up to Christ. That is, we are to come into His immediate presence. But we are not exalted. We do not become like Christ in that way. This refers to the Mormon doctrine of exaltation, whereby Mormon men and women believe they can themselves become gods. I know. That's what I thought the first time I heard this. When they are exalted into the celestial kingdom and become equal with God the Father. Now, James White, prominent... Um, um, a Southern Baptist uh, theologian, uh, speaker, preacher, really great guy if he can talk about something other than Calvinism. Um, <laughs> James White was in a discussion, a friendly debate, with a Mormon elder at Brigham Young University, and he said, so who was the first God? And the Mormon elder said, since we believe in a literal infinite number of gods... There was no first one. Mormonism is the single most polytheistic religion in the history of mankind. In that even the Hindus with their 360 million gods put a limit on the number of gods. But the Mormons do not. Okay, so now we go back to this Mormon doctrine of the gospel and we say, what does it mean when they say, we believe in Jesus Christ? Do they believe the same thing that we believe? No. What did Jesus say was the first and most important commandment? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is no other God. It's, a, it's the purest statement of monotheism in the history of mankind. Could the Mormon Jesus have made this claim? No. The Mormon Jesus, presumably, believes in the teachings of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, which says there are an infinite number of gods. So... Um, uh, so, um, so they believe in the exaltation to Godhead in the celestial kingdom. Interestingly, they follow this strange statement in their declaration of the gospel with something that is absolutely true. They almost quote directly from the Bible by saying, The Savior has promised us that if we endure to the end, that's a quote from the Revelation, Faithfully living the gospel, he will hold us guiltless. That's a quote from the gospels before the Father at the final judgment. Right? So it is absolutely true that if we endure to the end, he will hold us guiltless before the Father at the final judgment. But what happens is you read this exaltation to the celestial kingdom thing and your mind goes, er? and then you keep reading and you find something that you recognize find something familiar, and you say, oh, okay, well, maybe I misunderstood that. And you move on a little further. And then they end their presentation of the gospel with this. In the latter days, or the dispensation of the fullness of times, the gospel has been restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. Has been restored? What does that mean? 
It means that it was lost and Joseph Smith restored it. It means that at some point in history, people stopped teaching the gospel altogether and Joseph Smith was God's chosen instrument to return the gospel to the earth. In fact, Mormons believe that Joseph Smith will sit in judgment over them at the final judgment. That it won't be the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but rather the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and Joseph Smith. Now, why am I talking about Mormonism? It sounds unkind of me to be talking about Mormonism. But remember where we started? Remember we started with the angry Jimmy Kimmel? Remember we started with the angry Paul of Tarsus? He sounded unkind too. In fact, I think that it would behoove me in my ministry to make a better use of the phrase, you brood of vipers, because that's what Jesus said, and I want to be like Jesus. Now, how many churches would kick Jesus out of the church for being unchrist like if he said, you brood of vipers? You are graves. You are whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. Oh, now Jesus... We can't be talking like that. They're just people. You need to be kind to them. You need to be loving and Christ-like. Oh, Jesus. It's actually a well-crafted ruse. It blends some truth with some lies and mixes them in such a way as they are not easily recognized for the first or second hearing. But here's... The danger of Mormonism. They're good people. They are such good people. They are kind and sweet and generous and loving. And when you need someone to be kind and sweet and generous and loving to you, it doesn't much matter what they're saying. You can sort of say, oh, I don't understand this doctrine, but I'm sure these kind and sweet and generous and loving people do, and they're kind and sweet and generous and loving, and I need that in my life right now. And so, people leave the church all the time and become Mormons. What are they doing? They're following a gospel that neither Paul nor an angel from heaven has preached to them. They're following another gospel. And what does good and sweet and kind and loving Paul say about them? Let them be accursed. Now, we may be a little bit more familiar with the Greek term for this. Andrew, stop that. We may be a little bit more familiar with this, with the Greek term for this. The Greek term is anathema. Has anyone ever heard the term anathema? Um, it, it was used a lot by the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages and before um, when, uh, um, when they wanted to get rid of someone. Martin Luther was declared to be anathema because he changed things. So, we're getting back to Galatians, what is Paul talking about here? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're going to be spending the next several Sundays digging into that very question. We'll be studying the book of Galatians this summer and asking what is the real gospel and how do we recognize false ones. Now, why are we concerned with this? Why, you may ask, do we need to know what the, that the Mormon gospel is false? Why do we need to know that the Muslims are wrong? Why do we need to be able to spot the errors in Jehovah's Witness teachings? Shouldn't we all just get along? Shouldn't we just love one another and be kind and smoke a doobie? Some of you are from the 60s. We do not do these things because we want to win. We do not gain any personal victories by pointing out the errors in cults like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. We do not do these things to show ourselves superior. 
We do not do these things because of an inflated sense of self-righteousness. We do these things because souls are at stake. The eternal life or death of the people we meet. You have never, ever met a person who is immortal. Every person you have ever met will live forever or they will die forever. This is of the utmost importance. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? Anyone want to volunteer to give me a brief explanation of what the gospel is? Because the world will ask you. The world asks you every single day, what do you believe and why do you believe it? What do you believe, why do you believe it, and why should I believe it? What do you believe, why do you believe it, why should I believe it, and what impact will it make on my life? The gospel is the answer to that question. The world asks you this every single day. How will you answer them? And while you think about that, let's bow our hearts.